they actually are, are rules, not rules, but a philosophy that you want to cite. And again, I, I sound like a broken record, but I keep going back to the 1880s when Von, Von Bismarck was trying to unite the Germanic states. And the idea of how do I get these folks to be behind me? It was a political decision. And he said, I can offer welcome and social security. And once they get a taste of this, they'll they want to give it up. And he successfully rolled up all the other states after militarily conquering them. But he pacified them by saying, look, this is what I'm about to do. And that started the ball rolling. You had the Frankfurt School uh, a little bit after that, which was the heart of our progressivism, which was then brought over to this. And basically it says, life's too hard for all of us to decide for ourselves what that life should be. Now to me, live for your die, and I'm glad you brought it up, Alan. Live for your die, death is not the worst of all things. And it puts a different slant on it, because it, you're right, we just trivialize it. Live for your die. Every, you know, everywhere I go when I travel for, for being a blogger, people say, oh, that's a great model, live for your die. And they, it just rolls off the tongue. But very few of us, even though we live in New Hampshire, really sit down and contemplate, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. It means, just like we were saying at the dinner last night, we pledge our sacred honors, our lives, and our fortunes. How many of us actually sit and say, I'm willing to do that, to live free, or die? You know, all of us are... I will be kind. We're, we are all of the age here at this table where we remember that phrase, better red than dead, at the height of the Cold War tensions with the former Soviet Union. We could have been annihilated any day. And a lot of people said, hey, screw that. I don't want to die. I don't mind being uh, living under a communist regime as long as I'm alive. And I contrast that always. Live free or die, better red than dead. And the second part of that phrase, Death is not the worst of all evils. And the question is, do people really believe that in New Hampshire? The ordinary person. We are the political junkies here at this table, sure. guys. We, we are the 1%, or the 1% of the 1%. We get that message. How many of us actually live it? And what do you think the ordinary person feels when they, when they hear that? Have, have they explored it in depth? I don't know if they have. Yeah. And the fact is that we know that when, when it's been the case, when um, people have succumbed to the pressures and the promises, oh, we're going to give you everything, uh, and it becomes a welfare state, much of which has happened in this country already, the end result, of course, is never good. It doesn't work in the long run. So, so people really have to think hard about what do you want, and that's the responsibility. And I think in New Hampshire, people do take it seriously. Yep. I don't know that everybody verbalizes it to that extent. I think they do take it seriously. What do you think, Alan? Um, well, I think I think people take it seriously, but I I, I guess I have to. Uh, uh, I, I feel that what Skip was getting at here was probably closer to. Uh, to, to what he may have been thinking and, and what I'm thinking here and that is that there are that probably the majority of the population takes the phrase and 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 they 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 like it they're pleased with it but they don't really recognize the the depth of the meaning of the uh, of live free or die that you know they can say it and I think they focus on the live free part. Uh, I'm not sure that if it came to that point where it, it meant that they were putting their lives on the line, that they would be necessarily willing to put their lives on the line. It remains to be seen. Um, I mean, that's there's there's a lot to that when you say or die. And, well, there, uh, cer there certainly is. That. I know. I personally have thought about it, and um, I don't have a problem with it. I, I absolutely, of course, you know, at my age. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe 50 years ago I might yeah. have felt differently. <laughs> well, we are now joined by yet another New Hampshire uh, resident and also fellow Grokster, Don Ewing. And Don, welcome this morning. Good morning, Chef. Yeah. Morning, morning, Don. Good morning, Don. How are you? Okay. It, uh, we're talking about live for your die as being part of the American dream. By the way, if you're having a hard time, we have the headphone amplifier here, and this would be your dial to move. I'm fine. Okay. I, I can't always set them up the way that I think everybody needs. 
but uh, it, it really is a, a serious subject because we are in, to bring Don up to speed we are faced in a, what I believe is a cold civil war between the American founders vision and the progressive vision you know, are we going to continue to be a nation of rugged individualism of a civil society that voluntarily bands together to solve a problem and then disbands to one or the other thing or whether we're going to outsource our responsibilities to government like they do over in Europe and other socialist type states and let them live, take care of the, the main decisions by ourselves. So Don, what, what's your thoughts on this? I know that you are a prolific letter writer in the uh, local papers against some of these um, nitwits uh, and, and you certainly... <laughs> Well, sometimes there, there are some folks I go, uh, where do I even begin to start to write a letter? Yet Don is able to, to plow through and cogently uh, take down their arguments. So, uh, you're, you're getting a little deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the waiters are in I, the other bag. I, I, I occasionally write a letter. I appreciate it that it's recognized. I'm amazed when anybody reads it. But, <laughs> I think we've been in a, frankly, I think we've been in a war for a, a long time. It, there, I'm sorry, it's, there's been a war for a long time. Except that just like our war with radical Islam, we didn't, we didn't, we weren't fighting. We weren't aware. But I think there was always a silent majority that believed in constitutional government, in balanced budgets, in rewarding good behavior, not bad behavior, um, doing things that make common sense. But life was too good for most people, and it didn't seem that things were going that bad. And so we decided, well, you know, the experts, they really knew what the best way was to take care of the poor. We thought it was to make sure they got a job. But they said, oh, no, that's not right. You know, you need to give them stuff. And, and if you don't give them stuff, then you're really cruel and you're a nasty uh, person and um, you're very greedy. You're not willing to share. Uh, but I, I think that we are seeing such a disintegration and such an immorality of our country with the debt that we've created and we're passing on to uh, future generations that, that the American people who have been silent have awakened and said, no more. Uh, there are too many threats to our liberty, There's just too much that's going wrong, and we have been awakened and we have realized the experts really don't know anything. They haven't solved the war on poverty. We've been fighting for 50 years. We've spent trillions and trillions of dollars. There's no fewer poor people than there ever were. In fact, we know that they just keep changing the definition of what's poor. Our poor are rich compared to most of the rest of the world. And yet, oh, they're just so poor. Well, I'm sorry for people who are poor, but um, this is remembering a document I read many years ago, so I don't have the source. But the average poor person only works 19 hours a week. But if they worked 40 hours a week, like the rest of us, or 50 or 60, like many of us, or 90, they wouldn't be poor. So I, I think there's a revolution here, of the, of the, or an awakening of the people who are responsible and want to pass on a country with the freedoms and the opportunities that we all grew up with, we want to pass it on to the next generation. And so I think the war's always been there. I just think we haven't been participating. And we have to. It's, it's sort of, Obama is sort of our 9-11. That's a, wow, a good that's, way of putting that, it. That's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> that's interesting. Well, in a, in a way, uh, I think yeah. Don is very right in that since he's come on board, I think he's started to become aware of what his philosophy was. I likened it to a diesel and a cigarette. Uh, Obama and his cohorts having the green light on the sun and the house started to push that political closer and closer closer and closer together. But it always needs a spark. Even though the hot gases and that's something that we're ready to ignite, nothing will happen. 
but then one day Rick Santelli, an economics reporter and author of the Chicago Board of Trade on MSNBC of all places, had that Tea Party rant, and all of a sudden, along with Glenn Beck, he started to hear, I'm not alone, and boom. And since that time, we've seen the Tea Party in the last three years grow to be a major political party. And they're called extremists for one reason. One reason they don't want to go They don't want to go and help people through government. They want to go back to constitutional values. They want to be able to say, it's not government, it's uh, purpose to live your life. We want them to go. We want a frugal government that lives within its means and we want frugal means. And I think you're very right on that. Uh, there is that problem. And I think that pushback is happening. And I don't think it's done yet. I keep hearing the Tea Party's dead, the Tea Party's dead. And actually, I have to say this at this point. Both Diane and uh, Alan uh, hold uh, official ranks with the HDLP. Let's see. Uh, Diane, you have a line. Uh, I'm the ride town chair. You're also the uh, uh, secretary uh, of the executive uh, committee for the state. And then you're no longer a vice chair. An area. Oh yes, yes, that too. The county, Rockingham County vice chair, okay. or not vice chair, but area one chair. And you're, Sorry, you're excuse in, me. You're in a similar situation, Alan. Uh, you are the chair of the Barnstead Alton Republican. Yeah. You are the chairman of the County Republican. That's right. And you are also uh, an area vice chair. As well. I'm the area vice chair for the NHGOP, Area Five. Right, just Merrimack, Belknap, and the Concord City. They're greedy. They they yeah. keep all these jobs to <laughs> right, themselves, right? Because you know how people are fighting for them. <laughs>